this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new reading from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today, again in collaboration with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress, from the United States of America, who I'm connected with, we are the technical support of a program called Skype. And we are doing today, as I said, the 51st reading of the wonderful book by Steve Wahlberg, End Time Delusions. The delusions are so vast, so deep, you can call them, like Tom always did, he framed the phrase, in my understanding, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, the greatest delusion since the Garden of Eden. And we are in the chapter 21 that speaks about the path of the virus, the virus where the delusion is injected into the brains of men, and men all of a sudden can't think clear for themselves anymore, because as it is written in Revelation, the peoples of this world are drunk with the wine of the fornication of the whore of Babylon. Welcome to the broadcast, Tom. Yes, thank you, Yerk. It's great to be here and with you and uh, the listeners and to continue the reading of Steve Wahlberg's book, uh, The Greatest Deception Since the Garden of Eden is, taught, is, uh, is uh, the subject of this book. And uh, Steve Wahlberg is to be commended for having the courage, and not just the knowledge, but the courage to write this book. And uh, I, um, I'm grateful to him, though I hardly know the man. Spoke to him a couple times on Skype. Uh, but uh, listen, uh, the same conclusions uh, that the Lord has brought to uh, uh, Steve Wahlberg I got the same way, and uh, it's it's a it's a it's an unbelievable eye opener, and I I hope to, that the that the listeners will patiently listen to our repetition and our uh, our comments and add it to the information that uh, 
Steve Wolberg gives in his book and come to a much, much greater understanding than you've ever had before about the Bible, about Christ, about Daniel's 70th week, and about the seven years known as the Great Tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. The record needs to be corrected. The churches have taught us nothing but errors since at least 1805 or 1810 AD. The deception that are coming from the deceptions that are coming from the churches are well, they've become the orthodox teaching. And if you teach the truth, you're viewed as a heretic. But there's one caveat. What Yerk and I believe, what Steve Wolberg and I and Yerk believe in, was the common belief at the time of the Protestant Reformation. So nothing that Steve Wolberg says in his book, nothing that Yerk Glissman says in his commentary and his other readings, nothing that Tom Fress says, either on this program or my ancient, my, my old Inquisition update program on First Amendment radio, or in personal private conversation. Nothing is different than what was believed by all Protestants prior to the, to the uh, uh, perpetration of futurism in the Protestant and evangelical seminaries. That is what is the newest thing in Christendom. What they began to teach in the Protestant and Evangelical seminaries about 1805 or 1810, not so awful long ago. And it has completely overturned the truth. And We've all been taught it. We've all believed it. We've all bought the lie, hook, line, and sinker. None of us can claim to be unaffected by this greatest of all delusions, myself included. But we must know the truth. We must return to the faith that was once believed by the saints. And... Uh, we need to expose the lies that have overtaken the churches and have deceived the whole world. It's a tall thing to ask, but we ask humbly for his own sake that the Lord give us grace and strength to continue to tell the truth to whoever will believe it. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Thank you, Tom. That is a good moment for me to take over and go back to the book reading that we are going to start today. In this next chapter that we started last time, that is called The Path of the Virus. We were speaking actually about the time that uh, Tom just mentioned here, or the time of um, the beginning of the 19th century and uh, later on, of course, when the virus was implanted into the different churches. Futurism was implanted by even uh, forgerized Bibles. And we speak about that later today in the reading when we come to the Schofield Bible that Tom already mentioned last time in our reading. But this is now a, a quote that comes out of the book of uh, The Incredible Cover-Up, a, a picture and, and a book that I t uh, showed to you last time already because this little paragraph that we are going to read right now, this quote from that book is repetition. We read that already last time. It speaks on Irving and Darby's rapture, then Antichrist views. And Macpherson wrote something about it, but before that I want to change the picture to Edward Irving, because he's mentioned here, Edward Irving, and John Nelson Darby also. We have these two people. Let me just see where did I put Darby here. That's Darby. So you have these two people, and Macpherson wrote on this, quote, 
Into this, meaning the futurist system, both Darby and Irving had injected a further refinement based upon a declared attempt to reconcile the different parts of the New Testament which they considered to be relevant. In their view, the second advent, meaning the coming back of Jesus Christ, would take place in two stages. Interesting is, of course, that we, hear, that we read here, in their view. Well, that means it is not the biblical view, it is the view of John Nelson Darby and it is the view of Edward Irving. But the Bible says no prophecy is of private interpretation. And it is a prophecy that Jesus Christ is coming back. So their view already is something that you can easily throw overboard because it's not biblical. Because you cannot biblically prove their view when they say the second advent, the coming back of Jesus Christ, would take place in two stages. First, there would be a quiet appearance, the quote-unquote presence of Christ when all true Christians, the true church, would be removed from the earth. This was the quote, rapture of the saints, unquote. Only then, when the restraining presence of the Holy Spirit in his own people had been removed from the world scene, would Antichrist arise. His rule would be brought to an end by the second stage of the Advent, the public quote-unquote appearing of Christ in glory. Now, I also have to make a little comment on this, and I know that Tom will fall in this and help me a little bit. Because when it speaks here, uh, when the restraining presence of the Holy Spirit in his own people had been removed from the world scene, this is an interpretation of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, isn't it, Tom? The yes, one it who is. now restrains us, as Paul said. But when Paul was speaking, he said, the one who now letteth must be taken out of the way. And he spoke to the Thessalonians face to face, and then he told them that the one who now letteth is the Roman pagan Caesar. He couldn't write it in these words, and we spoke about that already in earlier broadcasts. But the point is, the futurists like to twist these words and like to twist, twist 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and replace the pagan Roman Caesars with the Holy Spirit for crying out loud. That's the agenda here behind it, isn't it, Tom? Yes, absolutely. And not only the, all that you said, but to cast this catching away 2,000 years into the future. When Paul said, now, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then that man of sin will be revealed, that wicked Okay, so Paul was looking for the rise of the Antichrist, that wicked. Well, the, that wicked, that Antichrist could not come to power as long as the Roman Caesars were still in power. Otherwise, the Roman Caesars would have put it down in its, in its infancy, would have stomped the, the Antichrist into oblivion before he could come to power. He was talking about two ruling powers of the Roman Empire, okay? And we, we can't be talking about another empire. It has to be Roman because Daniel said there would only be four Gentile kingdoms until Christ returned. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. So it's a Roman Empire that has been ruling and reigning in this world since before Christ was born. And what was restraining the rise of the Antichrist was the old Roman government. And when it was taken out of the way, the new Roman government would come to power. The papacy. It's Roman. It's just as much pagan as was the old Roman Empire. But now it has taken upon itself the power of God on earth. Okay? That's the Antichrist. That's what it means, a counterfeit Christ or another Christ or a replacement of Christ, a counterfeit Christ. That's what the papacy is. That's what his title, the vicar of Christ, literally means. Okay? 
So the pagan Roman Empire had to become the papal Roman Empire. And ever since, man has known who the Antichrist is. Now, was the Holy Spirit taken out of the way? No. No, the Holy Spirit is still guiding and directing and teaching God's people and revealing to them the secrets in the Bible and, and convicting of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and doing what the Holy Spirit is given us to do. Okay? So what's your pastor teaching you? He's teaching you a load of garbage. An absolute load of garbage. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that Christ cannot come until first there comes a falling away and that man of sin be revealed. That's what the Bible teaches. But what is taught in the churches? That Christ is going to come first and rapture us out, and then the Antichrist will be revealed. Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the Bible? Or are you going to believe your Jesuit-trained Protestant in name only pastor? Okay? Or Irving and Darby. Place? You're going to believe John Nelson Darby? You're going to believe Cyrus Schofield? You're going to believe Irving? You're going to believe the Irvingites? You're going to believe the Jesuit dupes in this world? The scripture plainly says Christ cannot come except there come a falling away first and then that man of sin be revealed. Does that not what the scripture says? That's absolutely what the scripture says. But what does your pastor tell you over and over and over and over again? That Christ is first going to come. We're going to be raptured out and then the man of sin is going to be revealed. You've got a choice to make. Make it today. Are you going to believe the scripture? Or are you going to believe your Protestant futurist deceiver? It's just that simple. It's just that simple. Now, if you believe your Protestant pastor, you're going to remain deceived. And, and there's, there's nothing that can spare you of all the horrors and all of the grief that is coming your way. And you must choose who you're going to believe. Okay? Choose rightly. Choose the Scripture and the Scripture alone. Even if a so-called Holy Spirit tells you in some kind of ecstatic utterance or some dream or some vision that what has no, become so popular and well-known and believed in the churches today that Christ is first going to come and then that man of sin will be revealed. That is not what the Scripture says. And it is points the finger right directly on top of the deception of futurism. Because that's what futurism teaches. That Christ is going to come first, and then we're going to be removed, and then the Antichrist is going to be revealed. That is exactly the opposite what the Scripture plainly teaches. So you've got to decide what authority you're going to believe. You've got to decide whether that man behind the pulpit of your church is a minister of righteousness or if he's a minister of Satan himself transformed into the minister of righteousness. The greatest deception since the Garden of Eden is now the unanimous teaching in the churches today. And you're going to agree with me eventually if you pay attention, if you listen and pray and ask God's grace, you're going to agree with me that churches are the worst place to serve the Lord. 
The most unlikely place for the truth to be told is in the churches today. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, and uh, that the listeners understand us correctly. It is not important that you agree with Tom Fress. It is important that you agree with the Bible. The That's Bible right. And the Bible alone. Huh? I don't claim to be any authority whatsoever. Christ is the head of the church, and we are all brethren. This is just one brother speaking to another. I have no authority over anyone. I exert no authority over anyone. It's just my merciful duty, as painful as it is, to share the truth with anybody that will listen. That's what you would expect of a loving brother, to suffer whatever pains necessary to tell you the truth that nobody else will tell you. Back to you, Yerk. Right, Tom. Concerning the highly probable link to Margaret MacDonald, that uh, Scottish lessee we talked about last time, Macpherson testified, quote, since Margaret MacDonald was the first person to teach a coming of Christ that would precede the days of Antichrist, it necessarily follows that Darby, back to whom pre-tribism can easily be traced, was at least the second or third or even farther down the line. To date, no solid evidence has been found that proves that anyone other than this young Scottish lassie was the first person to teach a future coming of Christ before the days of Antichrist. Before 1830, and we know 1828 or 1829 was the year of the Emancipation Act in England, Christians had always believed in a single future coming, that the catching up of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 will take place after the Great Tribulation of Matthew 24, and here I made a comment that we are going into just in a second, at the glorious coming of the Son of Man, when he shall send his angels to gather together all of his elect. The catching up of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 will take place after the Great Tribulation of Matthew 24. That, my dear brethren, is also a deception. This is a false teaching, before, before, because everything... That tribulation happened in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. This may be the subject of future readings and discussions I will have with Tom here on uh, Inquisition Update and Hour of the Truth videos. But as Daniel chapter 9 was fulfilled in the past by Jesus Christ, so was Matthew 24, the famous Olivet Discourse, and that does not speak of a future tribulation in the end times. It speaks of the tribulations, of the rumors and wars of the time that leads up, of the led up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Here, this author takes a detour into mixing also very easily, that is the happening to people, mixing the holy with the profane, or the truth with the lie. The great tribulation of Matthew 24 is not what is going to be in the end, because this is what they always speak about, the great tribulation coming, the great tribulation. That is the quote-unquote 70 years of uh, uh, Jacob's trouble, right? The time of when they say... The time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah, the, the time of when they say uh, before the rapture happens. Yeah, that BS. Yeah, we gotta be very careful of this. Don't mix Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, into the future. And this is what the author does here. Before 1830, Christians had always believed in a single future coming. That's correct. That the catching up of 2 Thessalonians 4 will take place, and that is now wrong what stands here, after the Great Tribulation of Matthew 24, because that happened already in the past. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the catching up, will take place at the glorious coming of the Son of Man. That's why I put this in blue. What I underlined in blue is the truth that the catching up of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 will take place at the glorious coming of the Son of Man when he shall send his angels to gather together all of his elect. After the great tribulation of Matthew 24, you should scrap that out. That is not biblically correct. Listen, can I simplify this a little bit? Yeah, please, Tom. I turn to over <laughs> complicate things sometimes, I yes. know. No, 
<laughs> well, I, I don't mean I don't mean to, to uh, da- da- gainsay what you've said, but listen, there's a very simple uh, rule of thumb to go for here. Matthew 24, known as the Olivet Discourse, describes a horrendous period of time for the Jews at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. Yeah, a horrible time as has never been before. That's right. The Jews had never suffered this kind of... This puts the Babylonian captivity into the background. Uh, That was a Sunday picnic. In comparison. Yeah, that was a Sunday picnic compared. I mean, the, the the prophet told the people to go to Babylon, build houses, and live. Okay, nobody said it was a cakewalk to go to Babylon in the Babylonian captivity. But compared to what took place in 70 A.D., after the Jews had rejected their own Messiah, no one can equate any other horror in history with that which took place, what the Jews suffered at the hands of the Romans in 70 A.D. I'll leave you to Josephus or any of the other great historians to discover what really happened. Uh, That great tribulation for the Jews after they'd rejected their Messiah. But look, there's going to be another great tribulation for the whole world for a similar cause. Because the whole world is going to worship the Antichrist. They already do. You want me to say it again? They already do. And and how can that possibly be, Tom? How could it possibly be that the whole world worships and obeys the Antichrist? Today. Because they don't know who the Antichrist is. They think the Antichrist is future. He's been here all throughout the Christian era. Since no later than 475 A.D. And just like the Bible says, that man of sin, that city of Rome reigns over the kings of the earth. Just ask Henry IV of Germany. Just ask any king, any prince, any queen, any potentate, anywhere in the world, who do they serve? And if you doubt what I'm telling you, all you got to do is go to Google and punch in, you know, Google Images and the papacy and the name of any world leader, and you'll see them bowing and worshiping and kissing his ring and wearing black and taking their orders. You can't call me a liar when the, when the visible proof is so easily available, so readily available, so irrefutable in its depictions. Now, you try to tell me, Tom, that the governor of the United States takes orders from Rome? Exactly what I'm telling you. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Yeah, how many times did George W. Bush fly to Rome? Well, he could kick (laughs) Air Force One in the flanks, and she would just take him there all by herself with no direction whatsoever. She'd been to Rome so many times, she knew how to get there all by herself. All the kings of the earth do. It wasn't just George W. Bush. It wasn't just Ronald Reagan. It wasn't just Bill Clinton. It wasn't just George H.W. Bush. It wasn't just President John F. Kennedy. It's the whole presidential list. They're all vassals of the papacy. They all take their orders from the papacy. The CIA is better known as Catholics in Action. They are Roman Catholics that run the CIA. That's not even disputed. Remember, okay? Tom. That's remember, not even disputed. Remember, Tom, when uh, last week I spoke about this quote from the German Kaiser when he met Pope Leo the Thirteenth in 1903. Sure. Tell and, him again. And the quote in the memoirs of the German Kaiser in his book, uh, uh, Happenings and. Uh, people, let's call it like this, uh, he met between 1878 and ni- 1918, 
And when he was in 1903, in the year the Pope died later on, in a private audience with Pope Leo XIII, the Pope said, I want Germany to be the sort of the Roman Catholic Church. And when the German Kaiser said, but your excellence, I'm sorry, the German Reich of uh, or the Holy Roman Reich of German nation doesn't exist anymore, times have changed, the Pope still insisted on his point. What Absolutely. does that mean? He insisted on his point. He said, I tell you, Germany is right. going to become the sort of the Roman Catholic Church. Point. That's it. And then it. a few years later, we have the outbreak of World War I. A few years later, we have the outbreak of World War II. And a few years later, after that, the sword switched Korea? hands from Germany to the United States of America. Did yeah, anybody I... ever tell you that Operation Paperclip is just the fulfillment of switching the sword from Germany to the United States of America? That's right. When That's all the thought. Nazi, all the high-ranking generals of the Third Reich in Germany were transported to the United States of America and other countries to, like Reinhard Gehlen, building together with Wild Bill Donovan, the CIA, building up the Mossad, the secret service of the, uh, of the Israeli nation that was founded in 1948. Now do you understand what that all means? Now you understand that if the German Kaiser would have said no, that he didn't uh, abdict his place in 1918 and went for a few years living in exile in Netherlands, but he would have been killed and the Roman Catholic Church would have forced their wish upon Germany anyway. That's right. And as soon as the Nazis came to power in Germany, they signed a concordat with the Vatican to protect the Roman Catholic Churches because they were going to together go on a crusade. Within the first Muslim few months of the rule of Adolf Christians. Hitler. Yeah. That's right. On the 20th of July in 1933, Germany signed a concordat with the Vatican, and that concordat is still today, we are, having, we are speaking of the 16th of June 2021, still unaltered in work, in force. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And what happened after Germany lost the Second World War, the United States became the new sword bearer of the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholic Crusades continued with Korea, Vietnam, and every conflict that has taken place ever since then. The United the sword was just simply passed from Nazi Germany to, quote, unquote, God forgive me. Nazi Christian USA. USA. <laughs> Christian USA. God forbid. Christian USA. That's what they call it. They all call it a Christian nation. And what a blasphemy that is. What a blasphemy that is to call the United States of America the greatest servant of the Antichrist there ever was in the history of papacy. They call it a Christian nation. Well, like they call Roman Catholicism Christian, Tom. Right. It's the same abomination. They all <laughs> blaspheme God every time they open their mouth and regard Roman Catholic Church as a Christian church. They commit blasphemy. They blaspheme the name of Christ every time they do it. And they won't repent. Not unless God grants them repentance. And you better be on your face praying that God grants you repentance. Every one of us. Every one of us. We live in one of the most wicked nations in world history. And what makes us so wicked is that early in our founding, it was obvious to everybody, we knew the truth. And what was that truth? Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. And we forbid the practice of Roman Catholicism in this country. We forbid Roman Catholic canon law. 
We forbid the diocesan structure in this country. We forbid it lock, stock, and barrel. And now what do we have? A nation that is marked out in diocesan borders from border to border, from coast to coast. A nation that is marked out for Roman Catholic control. And the head of every one of those diocesan jurisdictions is a bishop of the Roman Catholic Church who answers to no one but the papacy. And <laughs> you call them an American. They answer to no one but the papacy, but you would call them both Christian and American. You see how deceived we are? Is this not the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden? Are we not hook, line, and sinker from cradle to grave deceived? If you can't see it, God open your eyes. Now, why is it that we are so deceived? How could this possibly happen? I'll tell you why, plainly and simply. We chose to believe a lie. We chose to abandon the truth. We chose to abandon the scriptural, the biblical, and the historical proof. The historical truth that the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the Judas Priest, the Beast, the one who deceives the whole world, the one who is drunk with the, bar the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, the one who has deceived the kings of the earth, the one who is drunk with the wine of her fornication, the kings of the earth who serve and obey Antichrist, and pass laws in the civil laws of this land that make us all obey Roman Catholic canon law. That's how we've been deceived. We believed that the Antichrist was not historical, as is the papacy, but that the Antichrist is a figment of our futurist delusion. We've chosen to believe a lie. And why do I say we've chosen to believe a lie? Because we once knew the truth. We had to abandon the truth to believe the lie. And we all believe the lie, so we're all guilty of abandoning the truth. And you know what? There's only one power in the universe that can help us. And that's the one we betrayed. That's the one that we betrayed. The one who died for us. The one who told us in advance through his prophet and apostle, Paul, that he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way and then that man of sin will be revealed. He told us ahead of time don't look 2,000 years in the future for the Antichrist. He's only just a couple hundred years away. And he's going to come and raise his ugly, diabolical Antichrist head just as soon as the head of the Roman government is changed. As soon as it's taken out of the way and it leaves Rome and goes to Byzantium or what later became known as Constantinople, then that man of sin will be revealed. And history has proven it. Daniel was correct about it. Paul was correct about it. John was correct about it. History foretold. History has confirmed it. Protestants for 2,000 years, have, well, 1,800 years believed about believed it, hook, line, and sinker. It's only the last 200 years. Only the last three generations of quote-unquote Christians have chosen to reject the truth 
and believe a lie. And now we're all made by our own government that could have been Protestant. Now we're made to worship the man of sin and obey all of his laws. I would very much like to add something to that, Tom. Go ahead. You gave a wonderful uh, summary of um, what, in the time of the colonies in the United States of America, was forbidden for Catholics to hold mass, to have uh, any office, uh, to have uh, dioceses, and to and all that stuff. What you said. I, I just want to add one little thing to that, and that is. I want to tell the people, when the United States of America, when the people of that country that you are living in today were told by the government to forget that the papacy was the Antichrist. I think many people are not even aware of the fact that one of the very first acts of the very first president, George Washington, was to forbid Guy Fawkes, or Pope's Day as it was called. Because it was a habit, not only in England at that time, where the Puritans ruled, but also in the colonies, to make a fire of a Pope puppet every 5th of November in remembrance of Guy Fawkes' gunpowder plot that wanted to blow up the Parliament, the King, and the whole family, and of course the Bible Committee with it all along, in 1605, on the Gunpowder Plot Day. Since then, the real Christians had remembered that day of the Gunpowder Plot with a fire, where they burned a puppet of the Pope in effigy, meaning they paraded with that puppet around and burned it as the Antichrist that it was. And one of the very first acts of the very first president of the United States of America was to ban Pope's Day or Guy Fawkes Day, as it was called, out of the United States of America. And when That's you right. ban and when you ban a tradition like that, where every year you are reminded that the Pope is the Antichrist and he wanted to kill the king who gave us the sixteen eleven King James Bible. Well, isn't it normal that the people forget that the Pope is the Antichrist, Tom? Yes, and what is really sad is most people that are listening, uh, being deceived by futurism, they've never heard this history. They don't even know who Guy Fawkes is. They don't know what the gunpowder plot was, and they've never heard it when it used to be common knowledge among God's people. Early in the colonial period, 12 of the 13 colonies were staunchly Protestant. They protested the Antichrist of Rome. The practice of Roman Catholicism was illegal in this country. Absolutely illegal in this country. And they had a celebration every year at the time of the gunpowder plot. Uh, I can't remember the date right off the top of my head. 5th of they November. Burnt, they, burnt a, they burnt an effigy of, of the papacy because they tried to blow up parliament. They tried to blow up the British parliament, and the object of that was to destroy Protestantism in England What's... and to destroy King James I, who gave us the King James Bible. That Bible was in the, in the process of being produced and translated into the English language. It was, the, it was the book that was going to liberate God's people from Roman Catholic domination, both in England and in the colonies. And they had to blow up Parliament to kill King James and the Protestants who were running the government. And because of that diabolical scheme in 1605 to destroy Protestantism in England, the Protestants of the, of the, of the Protestant colonies commemorated or remembered that day with what they called Guy Fawkes Day and they burnt effigies of the Pope and they burnt effigies of the of the Jesuit priest who uh, oh, ramrodded the, the, the gunpowder plot, uh, Guy Fawkes. And George Washington shamed, believe it or not, 
He shamed Protestants for holding such a celebration every year. His, his rationale was that Roman Catholics and Protestants together fought off the English army and the English navy dur during the, the, uh, the uh, uh, liberation of this country from British rule, the Revolutionary War, and that they ought to live together as brothers. But prior to Washington, there was no such thing in this country. No toleration for popery. No toleration for Roman Catholicism. No toleration for Antichrist. It was a Protestant nation. And we tried to defend our Protestant liberties and our Protestant history and reveal to the world who the Antichrist was. Let there be at least one nation in this world where the papacy does not have sway. That was the Protestant call during the Protestant colonial period. But Washington shamed the, col the colonists for observing Guy Fawkes Day and burning an, image, uh, an effigy of the Pope and, and effigies of Guy Fawkes during the celebration. And that was the beginning of the end of the United States, the first and only Protestant country. And we know that the Vatican, we've even talked about it, <clears throat> In this, in this discussion, that the Jesuits and the Council of Trent decided that if they could destroy Protestantism in England, Protestantism would fall everywhere in the world. And so they started to preach futurism in the Protestant and evangelical seminaries, both in England and in this country. And not and to not forget to... Sorry, not, sorry to interrupt you, but not to forget that that was one of the reasons why they split the colonies of England. Because as long as England had a sway over the colonies that were Protestant to the heart, they could not get England out of Protestantism. It was too strong with the United States or with the colonies yeah. also being Protestant. And that is what we all say, divide and conquer. Yeah. They divided England from the colonies. Yep. And the colonies did not suffer under the rule. Well, they made it look like that with quote unquote crazy King George III and all that stuff, but that's all theater they played before your eyes to get the people in an upheaval against England. And yep. if you want to destroy England, you have to separate England from the colonies. And that's what, you, what they did. Yeah. And they sold it to you as, now you have freedom. Yeah. <laughs> the, the uh, you have to understand that freedom is just a temporary, uh, a temporary state. The Roman Caesar gives to people as long as he wants to. Yeah? Freedom is a temporary state in Roman law. No, you I want the listeners to be sure to understand what we're telling you. What we're telling you is the whole object of the Revolutionary War was to destroy Protestantism, both in England and the colonies. And we all thought it was about tea and taxes, didn't we? The taxation on tea was simply a way to divide the colonies, north and south, in order to conquer what appeared for all intents and purposes to be a fledgling Protestant nation that had the resources enough to convert the whole world to Christ. And they had to destroy it. Just like they attempted to kill Christ in his crib, they had to destroy the United States. And the first method to succeed in that end was to separate once and for all the colonies from Protestant Great Britain so that they could both be destroyed.
And so with certain members, and you can just guess who they were, in the, in the Protestant Parliament of Great Britain, of England, they started levying heavier and heavier unjust taxes that would eventually cause that split. Yeah, they are called the, the friends of King George. And we read, right. about, we read about that in the book of uh, Rulers of Evil. Also about the Stamp Act. Yeah, it's not only yep. about the T's, it's also about the taxes that were introduced with the Stamp Act, when all of a sudden you needed a stamp to even buy a newspaper, for crying out loud. Yeah. Now, these things were used to be common knowledge in this country, but you're never taught that anymore in the schools. You're never taught what the Revolutionary War was really all about. It's enough that you think, you be led to think that it was all about tea and taxes, but tea and taxes, the Stamp Act and, uh, and all of it was simply a means to an end. And that end, the most desirable end, was to destroy Protestantism in this country and to give religious liberty to Roman Catholics who never previously enjoyed religious liberty in these Protestant colonies. And that's exactly what resulted from the Revolutionary War. Religious liberty for Roman Catholics. You roll the calendar 200 years down the road, what do you got? A whole Congress, a whole White House, and a whole Supreme Court that's run by Roman Catholics. Now we're learning the same lessons that Europe should have learned. The United States is no longer Protestant. You can't find a Protestant in this country. And how do you know? Just ask them. Who's the Antichrist? You're liable to get any answer but the right one. And if you don't know who the Antichrist is, you cannot call yourself a Protestant because a Protestant protests the Antichrist. Now, that's just how thoroughly Protestantism has been destroyed in this Roman Catholic country. A nation that was Protestant in the beginning has believed a lie called futurism, they have exonerated the papacy from the onus of Antichrist. Now we're all vassals of the papacy, whether we like it or not. Whether we, 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 whether we admit it or not, it doesn't matter whether you admit being a vassal to the... I've had people argue, I'm not a vassal of the papacy. The papacy doesn't have any authority over me. Do you obey, do you obey civil laws of this country? Do you obey the Constitution? Do you obey all the, the amendments? Do you, do you pay respect to the government of this country? Then you are a vassal of the papacy. Because as Richard Bennett said, Vatican control through civil law. That's right. Every civil law in your country too has to be in accordance with Roman Catholic canon law. And That's if right. it is not, the law will not be in effect. That's right. Yeah. Do you live in a county somewhere in a state in this country? What do you find in the city square in the county seat of a county? You find a cathedral. It's a government. And the head of it is the local bishop. You're a Roman Catholic, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you admit it or not, whether you accept it or not, you've been made to be a vassal of the man of sin in Rome. And you've had Roman Catholic canon law imposed upon you by your quote-unquote government whether it be federal government, whether it be state government, whether it be county government, whether it be municipal government, 
all power of government comes from the governor of the world, the papacy. Or they have no power at all. It's called a government de facto. And it can be removed whenever it's first convenient to the Roman Catholic Church or to the papacy. You see the governments being overthrown in this country? No. That means it's, it is a de jure government. One that is a friend and a servant of the man of sin in Rome. I'm sorry to burst your Christian bubble. You've been led to believe this is a Christian country, but then aren't we all the ones who call the Roman Catholic Church a Christian church? We're the ones who contribute to our own delusion. We are the victims of our own delusion. And that's by design. We are brought to our own delusion because we believed a lie. We once knew the truth and we repudiated it. Now we believe a lie. And that's when we came under the authority of the papacy. Now you wait say, now wait a minute, isn't that what happened in the Garden of Eden? God said, the day you eat of that tree, you will die. But the man of sin came and said, you will not surely die. Here, have a bite. And we obeyed, and then we became his vassals. It's all happening again, isn't it? That's why I call it the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And I've made my point, and I've proved it. I've backed it up with history. I've backed it up with Scripture. I've backed it up with common sense. No one can gainsay it. No one can deny it. It's the truth, and we got to do something about it. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I just needed a second to <laughs> come back into the spirit of this reading. I mean, we can, of course, start uh, reading again, but we will not finish the chapter today since we are already at an hour. And that means that we only have done so far maybe a one new paragraph in the reading of today. But I think the history lesson that you were given today in Tom's and my explanation of the last few hundred years of the history of Europe and the United States of America is much more important than reading the end of this chapter. We will postpone that until next time. And I suggest that everybody of you is going to start their own research, especially those people who are quote unquote patriotic and stand up. Oh, I am an American and America is a great nation. And think about what kingdom you should really be patriotic about. The kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is invisible, but which is here. Because already in the book of Acts, it is stated that <coughs> there were added thousands of souls daily to the kingdom of God. That is the kingdom that we should belong to. That is the nation that we should try, strive to live in. That is the nation whose laws we should obey, and those are the laws of God. Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And with that, I want to leave you to the next broadcast and give you a little advice on your own studies. I, was to, I just want to ask you to read one chapter of one book. One chapter, that's all. No more. Read chapter one of the book of Rulers of Evil and see how your government in Washington is not only infiltrated, but completely taken over by Roman Catholics who were 0.2% of the population in the time of 1776 and are now more than 25% of your 
population over there. Think about it. Read chapter 1 of Rulers of Evil until next time and then Tom and I, I think, will go a little bit into that and tell you that that chapter is irrefutable in the facts and proves that what Tom said, that the nation of the United States of America, as long as there were colonies, was protestant to the core and protestantism was taken away effectively with starting with one deed of the very first American president, George Washington, by abolishing Pope's Day or Guy Fawkes Day. And with that, I want to leave you to your own studies until next week. Thanks for watching and may God bless you. Bye bye and Maranatha. The President DeJoyer's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, but both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr. Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this house. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. But let me say this, if the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ in this trip. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.